Hi, I'm Chris Lee, and this is Virtually Speaking. Joining us today is Jay Samet, a serial entrepreneur and leader, a man who's worked with Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Paul Allen, the Pope, and the President. He's the most recent former vice chairman of Deloitte Digital, and over the decades, he's built and sold many of his own companies. He's been an executive or senior management at major companies, including Sony, EMI, and Universal Pictures. He's taken an equity stake in more than 80 companies, raised more than $800 million for startups, and helped grow multi-billion dollar juggernauts, such as LinkedIn and eBay, before they even IPO'd, and helped transform entire industries and revamp governments. Jay talks about the importance and practice of being disruptive in your industry, which is the mantra he's had for the past several decades, himself disrupting and causing major changes in industry after industry. His international major bestseller, Disrupt You, now in print in dozens of languages, is critically acclaimed and a must read according to the heaviest hitters in business. Jay has always been at the forefront of emerging technologies and trends, and is today known as a top expert in digital tech, artificial intelligence, virtual and augmented reality, smart wearables, the sharing economy, and autonomous tech. His March 2021 book, Future Proofing You, 12 Truths for Creating Opportunity, Maximizing Wealth, and Controlling Your Destiny in an Uncertain World, is already critically acclaimed and set to be another bestseller. Please join me now with the incomparable Jay Samet. Well, hello, Jay Samet. Thank you for joining me on Virtually Speaking. How are you doing, sir? Fantastic. Happy to be here. Good. Yeah, I'm happy to have you as well. You know, um, the conversations that I have with you over the years have been some of the most interesting conversations I have ever had with anybody on the planet because you have such a wealth of knowledge of uh, okay. so many emerging technologies, but also really uh, 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 rules of thumb and ideas around what it takes to be an entrepreneur, to be a disruptive person uh, or a disruptor, uh, to be innovative and to be creative. And um, I like how you, you join those two worlds together in both of your books, Disrupt You and Future Proofing You, your new book that just came out, there they are. And of course, um, you know, it's interesting because you you are a guy who was um, a, a C-suite level guy, a CEO, a, a founder, a partner, an investor, a board uh, member. And you've always come from this side of an, as an executive and done so many things in so many industries over the decades. Um, but you also talk about how you yourself, the reader of these books, can disrupt yourself and how you can future proof yourself. So tell us a little bit about how you do that and, and what the kind of general premise was of both of these books. In other words, why did you go towards the person rather than the company? So everybody thinks of changing the world, but nobody thinks of changing themselves. And once you can change that voice in your head that holds you back, that says that you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you can't achieve, once you can change that and realize how malleable you are, you then realize the world is just as malleable. So as you said, I've sat in the empty room and started billion dollar companies. I did the first auction, people know that as eBay, I worked with Reed Hoffman, launched LinkedIn, and I've been an investor in many startups. And then I've done the other side, running companies with hundreds of thousands of employees, and I've been a public NASDAQ CEO. And I noticed a pattern. You know, if you would have start, told me at the start of my career that dozens of friends would become self-made billionaires with a B, I'd ask you, you know, what are you smoking, Chris? Um, I was a regular working class family. But what I noticed is there's only two things you need to succeed, insight and perseverance. And I can teach people how to hone their insight. And I can teach people how to bolster their perseverance. And this is not just for the individual. This is for the corporation. In a world that is in having endless innovation, where every career will be disrupted, and after the pandemic, I don't have to make that case anymore, people have to realize disruption isn't about what happens to you, it's about how you respond. So I've watched major corporations cave in and fall apart because they can't adapt. They haven't trained their people to do that. So 
I've tried to simplify it. There's nothing in disrupt you or in future proofing you that is, you know, rocket science. It's just proven and practical. And I wrote disrupt you. I thought that would be my last book. I've had a, a amazing success with it. And the surprise factor of it, it's now in over a dozen languages. It's coming out this year in Urdu, Icelandic, and Polish. Is when I was a CEO, when you run a public company, your inbox is kind of like, I hate you, I hate you, they're suing us, this is on fire, here's today's problem. Very few CEOs get to control their whole day. When you write a book that changes people's lives, and all that I do is hold up a mirror to their soul, they, they do the change. I get what I call love letters. I get emails every day from all over the world. And I've kept a, a tab for my own curiosity. 140 countries, people have emailed me. Wow. But, but occasionally, I'd get an email that said something like this. This is all motivational, but I could never do this. And Jay Samet has thin skin. That really bugged me. <laughs> so I said, how am I missing this person? What, what am I not connecting? And it was usually somebody more towards the millennial generation. Mm. So I said, I'll put my reputation on the line. In Future Proofing You, what I did is I went out and I found a young man who grew up on welfare, who was homeless, couch surfing at friends' houses. Or, and I mentored him one day a week for a year to take him from welfare to self-made millionaire. The rules were simple. I gave him no capital. I didn't introduce him to any business contacts. And I didn't tell him what business to start. They had to start a business that took zero capital. So if he could do that, I believe that every reader reading Future Proofing You can relate. We all have this in us. Now, I don't want to make this a, an overnight thing that this is easy. His name's Vin. Vin worked nonstop. He didn't goof off online. He didn't go to the movies. He didn't date. How did you get he him? Worked. How did you get him to change this Focus. pattern of excellent question? Couch surfing and you know, uh, really not uh, being an entrepreneur at all, being the opposite of that. How did you get him to suddenly believe in you and himself? He didn't hate, he, yeah, he had to believe in himself. So the, the subtitle of this book is 12 Truths. So the very first truth is you have to have a growth mindset. So mm. it's kind of funny. I didn't let Ben read the book until it was typeset so he couldn't make any changes. And he found out in the book that in our very first meeting, I lied to him. I knew if I needed somebody to hit the ground running and hit that million dollars in under a year, which is an audacious goal, I didn't have time for him to slowly build up that confidence. So there is a psychological effect called the Pygmalion effect. A professor went to an elementary school, tested all the kids and told the teachers that three students would be super learners this year. They'd out excel everybody. And at the end of the year, when they tested the kids, guess what? Those three kids were. The professor lied. He never looked at the first test. He picked three names out of a hat. But if you tell people they're special and you treat them special, they believe it. It's the old Ford adage. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. So when I sat down with Vin in our first meeting, I said, I've interviewed hundreds of candidates. You're the only one that has all the attributes to become <laughs> a self-made millionaire. <laughs> and he saw somebody older, more successful, believing in him. He accepted it. That's amazing. At the end of the first 30 days, when he'd already earned $60,000, I didn't have to convince anything. Right. Because now, now he did it. And what was really interesting is you think every book's going to be this linear, like, oh, this is going to go so well. But midway through it, his business got sucker punched in the gut. He made about a half a million dollars, and it looked like it was over. Nothing that he did wrong, just too much to go into right now. Market conditions change. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not a bad book. A guy, you know, comes from nowhere, makes a half a million dollars, you know. And, but he had such a growth mindset at that point that he instantly pivoted and said, this isn't working. Let's try that. And when we did our month end, his month goal was $100,000. And that month he brought in 96,000 and he was beating himself up. And I'm thinking to myself, that's more than his dad probably ever made. That's more than he, you know, Six months ago, he couldn't have believed that he'd be upset that he only made 96000 But that's what he had turned on. I didn't do it. So you literally thought about this premise for your next book before you wrote the book. You went yes. out, you interviewed 100 people or found 100 people who were candidates. And then no, no, I only interviewed one. Oh, it was just him. the point. But you told, but so you, yeah, you I didn't lied look to at him. anybody else. So how did you pick him? No, because that... 
that would be unfair. If you went out and said, okay, I'm going to interview right. a million people. I'm going to teach somebody golf. Uh, you, young man, Tiger Woods, is it? Come over here. You know, then you're cherry picking the result. One candidate, I had to make it work or was it a valid premise? Um, I saw him at, at a, at a, at a uh, breakfast meeting that, that you know that we sometimes attend. And he was trying to hustle business doing social media as, as 50 million other millennials <laughs> do. Yeah. And he was up on a stage wearing gold lame one piece jumpsuit going back and forth like a cat in a cage, had all these ideas, couldn't get them out of his head. And I said, okay, at least he wants to do something. So a good mentor doesn't tell you what to see. They point you where to look. And the other thing that was different in this book, and you learn when you mentor, it's not a one-way conversation. I learned from him as well, is one of the 12 truths that I didn't, address and disrupt you that's in future proofing you is you can't fly solo. You're going to have to have a series of mentors in your life, right? The world changes too fast. The skills that you learn won't get you all the way through. Even if you're in the C-suite, you're going to still need mentors. When Bill Gates became a billionaire, his mother told him, go reach out to Warren Buffett. I think you need a mentor on how to be a billionaire. Right. So mother Teresa got her mentor sitting on a bus bench. So in Future Proofing You, I teach people how to use LinkedIn and other tools to find mentors. And it's not write a stranger, I get a million of these. Will you be my mentor? That's like walking to bar and say, hey, will you have my baby? It doesn't work that way. <laughs> but if you start a dialogue, if you see who's posting things, who's volunteers to charity, who has that type of heart, right. you may end up with a lifelong mentor without ever using the M word. Right. I mean, we've had great mentorship conversations as you yeah. built your business. And, and I enjoy and I, and I learn. The whole reason I write these books is to pay it forward, to help others be successful Yeah, and That's not to get into the politics of it. But when I looked at what happened in January at, at our nation's capital, what I see are thousands of people feeling left behind, left out, scrambling for leftovers. The bottom 140 million people in the US own less than 1% and they're clawing. At the same time, the top 150 doubled their net worth during the pandemic. Not doubled what they made in a year, doubled their worth. So what are those people doing differently? How is it possible that a new self-made billionaire happens every 48 hours? Can you teach that? Now, as you know, I've taught this at the university level. That was one of the ways I get back to the largest engineering school in the country. And first semester, I had two students do $150 million. Get in trouble with the school when they want to drop out. And I'm like, don't worry. I think they'll endow the university with a nice, <laughs> a, a nice thing in their future. But I love democracy. And you only have democracy if you have a thriving middle class. And the only people that create jobs are entrepreneurs. So yes, I've run large companies and I've always been brought in to be an entrepreneur. How do you change the culture? How do you make it dynamic? Uh, that's why Deloitte brought me in as vice chairman. I mean, here's a company that's 150 years old, but look to the future. Software and AI is going to replace most accounting jobs, most lawyer jobs, most middle management jobs. Right. Half of all jobs will disappear in the next five years in the US. So unless you're learning how to thrive from this uncertainty, how to see every obstacle as an opportunity in disguise. The other choice is being roadkill. Yeah, and, and what a great title you chose, Future Proofing You, for it to come out as we are getting through this pandemic is, is a wonderful title because it makes us think about, you know, this could happen again in the future and how do we have ourselves in a position where we can get through it and not be affected maybe in a way we were this time around that we can prevent in the future, but also how can we disrupt and, you know, how can and the, we innovate? And the you doesn't just mean the individual. Right. I mean, I was brought in to save Sony, right? A $200 billion company. I was brought in number three, way too late. They didn't want to change in Tokyo. Blockbuster owned the world, you know? Little Netflix, they thought nothing of it. Right. And this happens again and again. And here's what a lot of people don't understand. 
Most people were taught that here's the way you make money. I buy a banana for a dollar, I sell it to you, Chris, for $2, and that's how I make money. That's how we were taught in fourth grade. While that's mathematically accurate, that's not true. Because what that assumes is what's called in game theory, zero sum game. It's like a poker game. The only way I make money is to take money from you. Which means if you get the promotion and I don't, or they get our jobs, or immigrants are taking our jobs, or foreign countries, or robots, it becomes this dog eat dog brawl fighting over scraps. On the other hand, if I said, Chris, I just started a new company. I will sell you 10% for $10,000. What do I now have? I now have 10,000 in cash and 90,000 in stock. I could hire people with that. I could buy people. So most of the millionaires in the US didn't get there by making a profit. They didn't make it by slowly getting there. Yes, you can invest slowly over time and you should do that with your excess capital. That's what capitalism is. Warren Buffett, genius investor, but he made 99% of his wealth after he was 50. Mm. I'm on the wrong side of 50. And I'll tell you, I would have had a lot more fun doing it as Kylie Jenner did. She became a billionaire at 22. Now you say, oh, well, she's a Kardashian. There weren't any billionaires in the Kardashian family. So what did she do differently? What is it that's enabling people to do this? And again, we're all interconnected. We're one click away from 7 billion people. You only have to be right for a nanosecond to change your future. And so the 12 truths walk people through how to reevaluate their assumptions and how to have a step ladder to get to where you want to go that much quicker. Yeah. And um, in the book, you're talking about the 12 steps to future proofing you. Um, and the 12 truths, I, I, I should say. Um, but you also go into some of the technologies and you've also been known for talking about technologies. We've had incredible conversations about AI and VR and all of these tools that companies need to embrace that are really yeah. you know, creating the future and the shared economy and all of the things that you always see coming a mile away from uh, you know, the rest of us. So tell so us a the little- one, one of the truths is there is a trillion dollar opportunity for everybody hearing my voice right now. That's a trillion. That's a lot of freaking zeros, okay? <laughs> now, before I tell you what it is, let me prove it to you. Okay. Chris, first thing you wake up in the morning, you look at your phone. Last thing you go to bed, you look at your phone. Could you live without your iPhone today? No. No. I have, I have a Google Pixel. Okay, could you, could you run your business without your smartphone? Correct, you no. could not, no. It's, it's part of our lives. Yet 10 years ago, when Apple spent all that money to introduce us to this new thing and created it, right. let me tell you two of the top 10 apps that first year. The Fart app, you heard it right, and a game with cats, which is another way of saying no one envisioned Robin Hood or Open Table or any of the thousands of apps that made people millions and millions of dollars. Right. So now, over the next three years, you're no longer going to be taking your phone out of your pocket. You're going to be wearing glasses, heads up display, all your waking days. So instead of searching for information, information comes to you. Well, if Google doesn't own search here, they go out of business. If Apple doesn't sell you the glasses, they go out of business. If Facebook and you get it, et cetera. So the big guys are spending billions to build this infrastructure, the 5G, the edge computing, everything, but they're not making the apps that solve the day-to-day -day problems. So something as simple as you can read any menu anywhere in the world and not accidentally eat dog because it'll automatically translate. Or it can also talk to you so anybody can speak to you in any language and you'll hear it in your native tongue, just as if you're on Star Trek. This isn't science fiction. Google's a client, Microsoft's a client, Apple's a client. I know what's in the labs. I know what's, when the dates are on these things. And if you say, I'll never wear that, I don't believe it. I'll prove that to you. Last year in 2020, 80 million pairs of glasses were sold for more than $150 a pair that came with one app. Focus, <laughs> wanna read? You get them. Another 50 million that cost more than 150 a pair came with a separate app called Sun. 
you're outside, you're gonna wear sunglasses. So if I could suddenly walk into supermarket and show me just the products that are keto or halal or kosher or vegan and everything else disappears, that's a game changer. Not only is it a game changer for you, the user, and there's a company actually making that app, but that changes all sales and marketing. Because now we're going to live in a world with trillions of sensors that know where we are, where products are. So when I'm in my self-driving car on the freeway and they know that I've skipped lunch, it's two o'clock and I've usually stopped and eaten by then. And they know I like McDonald's and there's McDonald's 1600 feet ahead and there's a French fry floating in front of me. And if I grab it, the car goes there and I get a free French fry. That's changed marketing, that's changed sales, that's changed the funnel. Conversely, it also changes supply chain. The second somebody touches a product or buys a product, everybody down the chain knows. So the amount of impact that we're talking about in this fourth computer change, the first was the PC, the second being the internet, the third being mobile, is greater than the sum of the three of those. The impact is a shift of a trillion dollars over a five-year period. So I how do we take you, advantage of it? That gets me excited. Very simple. And I have this process in my book. Entrepreneurs don't sell things. They solve things. They solve problems. So if you have a problem in your life, <clears throat> can this technology solve it? You don't have to know how it works. You don't have to then, the heavy lifting's been done. I would love to be able to go to Hawaii. I don't have to know how planes work. I just have to get on one. So pick a problem to solve, grab that turf. And here's the other exciting thing. For those that social life involves swiping, there was a time less than a decade ago that no one had ever swiped before the iPad, right. okay? And Apple thought swiping would be really a cool thing, but how do you explain it to somebody in a TV commercial? How do you sell those iPads? How do you change everybody's interface? We used a mouse, you know, no one swiped. So they searched the world for a game and they found a failing game company that had 20 games in a row that lost money. And the game was called Angry Birds. Wow. So when the iPod, I mean, the iPad was being marketed, they put Angry Birds in every commercial, a hundred million dollars worth of media. You know what the result was for that gaming company? Forget how many games they did. They did $5 billion in lunchboxes, t-shirts, toys. You a get movie. it. So my point, yeah. So my point is TV series. If you have an app right now that solves something that is universal, you don't need a giant marketing budget. You can use what I talk about and disrupt you, OPM, other people's money. All these people fighting at the top, the Googles, the Microsoft, want to show and demonstrate something with their hardware. Why not have them demonstrate your solution and give you customers? I've done that again and again in my career. When I had a digital download store, I had to go up against Apple. That's insane. There are iTunes, they're everywhere. I'm just starting and I have zero budget. So I looked around, who has problems? It was the year that Spurlock did supersize me and McDonald's. First time in their history, their sales were down 9%. So all that I have to do is figure out how do I make my product the solution to McDonald's problem? So I said, McDonald's, I'll make you hip and cool. Buy a Big Mac, get a free track. They spent $60 million advertising that promotion beautiful commercial, amazing talent that they have. But what did that do? Opening week of my store, 20 million customers. Wow. Not a penny. That's what you can do this time around because everybody is scrambling to say, look what we have in this space. Amazing. So getting back to the new book, Future Proofing You and the 12 Truths, what is, <laughs> what is the you know, what is your favorite chapter? I know people have to read the book in order to find out what the 12 truths are, and I don't want you to go through all 12, but what would I'll be probably, your, favorite, your favorite one? I'll why? probably say the, the one that is the opposite of what everybody else tells you. Yeah. Is truth number three, that you need to embrace fear. Ooh. I hate all these charlatans that go, fear isn't real, fear's in your head. And they make up some acronym, you know, fruitcakes or ragtags. I don't know what, what they make <laughs> up. Okay. Let me explain something. Chris, 
thousand generations ago, your great, great, great grandfather, Ugg in the cave, <laughs> when that saber tooth tiger came and he hauled butt out of there, that's why you're here, because he was afraid. The oldest part of our brain, what's known as the lizard brain, has a fight or flight response. Right. Before I know what you're talking about, an argument, whatever you want to sell me, when you're having a meeting, the first thing goes through my mind, is this person trying to kill me? Mm -hmm. You don't have a choice. It's in a, a split second. So everybody has fears. <clears throat> Most people are fear, afraid of starting something or doing something different because I'll be embarrassed. Uh, fear of public humiliation, fear of losing my money, fear of losing others' money, fear of... Uh, failing. Okay. Yeah. Those are valid fears, but back to the saber to the tiger, I'll update it. you you have all those fears about your job and your career and everything. And you're walking down the street and an 18 wheel semi has no brakes. It's, it's honking its horn. It's coming right at you. Do you care whether you look silly? No, you replace those fears with a more existential fear. If I don't move, I will die. Well, if you have a job that you don't care about where you're not learning or growing and you're trading a day of your life, a week of your life, a month of your life, a year of your life. One day you'll wake up and you gave away your whole life. The most precious thing you'll ever have for what? So you should be more afraid of missing this opportunity of life, of living mm -hmm. a life of purpose than of any other fire. And if you don't believe me, go talk to your grandparents or go to an old age home and ask seniors, what's their biggest regret in life? And it's not what they failed at. It's what they failed to try. So now let me give you the second part of fear. If you accept what I'm saying, that we all have these fears, now let's flip the table. Whoever you're meeting with in business has the same fears. When I was young in my career, I remember once having this meeting with the CEO of Pepsi. Oh, this would change my company, my future, everything. I knew everything. I researched. I put so much time into it. This was the meeting of my life. But the CEO of Pepsi, this was the only thing stopping him from going to lunch. <laughs> so right. there's, there's no time for this argument. His stomach's growling. That's one of the four things that, that control your brain. So unless I can get his fear going, I can't get him to concentrate. Because once you elicit fear in somebody, your whole system has to find a way to pacify that fear but you can't stay in a frightened state. Athletes get the fear going to get the adrenaline to go the extra. When they go through and they win, the adrenaline comes down. So if you go into a meeting and say, you know, I came here first because my flight tomorrow's to Atlanta, Georgia. Right. Um, he, he's gonna lose his job if they do it and he doesn't, if it turns out something good. You're suddenly getting him thinking about self-preservation, embarrassment, right. the three fears. And I tell the story of how two presidential elections ago, I had a digital agency. And back then, as hard as it is to imagine now, not a single presidential candidate had ever spent a dime on social media advertising. It was all television. Right. I wrote a white paper saying this is what they should be doing. Nobody cares. So I used this fear technique. I set up meetings with the four presidential candidates, Obama and three Republicans. And I went to the campaign managers and I told them I could only meet him on these specific dates because I'm going to be <laughs> Massachusetts with Romney and Texas. And you get the idea. Yeah. And now they know if somebody else uses this new tool and they don't, they may never get hired again. They'll right. look foolish. So I better just hire this guy and stop him from going to the others. And each one wanted me to work exclusively. I said, no, you don't do that with ABC. You don't do CBS. So that's how I got them as candidates. This was a startup that had 30,000 in sales when I got there. 18 months later, News Corp bought it for 200 million. That's how you harness fear. So one of the 12 truths. And again, none of these truths you're gonna go, I don't believe it. You're gonna go, yeah, that makes sense, right? I didn't get to where I am because I'm smarter than the average bear. I'm not. I got here by making more mistakes than anybody else, All right? You fail your way through. A career or business is much like a video game. You don't sit down and go all the way and win. 
You hit an obstacle and you hammer and hammer until you figure out how to get past it. Then guess what? There's a new one. And that's, that's how Jeff Bezos could lose money with Amazon year after year after year after year and come yeah. out the other side as the world's richest man. Because money isn't made that old fashioned way. Amazing. My passion is teaching organizations, governments, how to be more entrepreneurial. Um, I started something down in Mexico. So in the US, we take this for granted. We have the, the Gateses and the Jobs and the Zuckerbergs. We have our heroes, right? Other countries don't. So we started down in Mexico Entrepreneur Week. It's kind of like Shark Week on Discovery. The president of Mexico and I did a whole big speech. They, they give awards to kids starting businesses. They build up that this is something to do. Because in many cultures, if you got out of your top engineering school and said, I got an offer and a job at Google, but mom, I'm going to start my own thing. The mom would pick up a frying pan and hit you over the head. It's just not, there's such a fear of change. And that's why I think my book is connected around the world and hit number one in these different countries that are embracing change and, and seeing a positive change. I mean, number one in Vietnam. And I, and I went over there and I was amazed. The happiest people I've ever seen on earth. Why? The people my age grew up during what they refer to as the American War, a horrible time. And now they see their kids and their grandkids having a better future, better potential. The future looks great. Here in the US, we have life expectancies getting shorter, not because of the pandemic, but because of self-inflicted things. Mm -hmm. So technology can solve things. And there's so many problems. And I end future-proofing you talking about sustainable technology. The idea of endless growth in a finite planet violates the laws of physics. Right. So eventually governments are gonna come down and have new rules or we cease to exist. So why not get ahead of it? When Walmart figured out after employees, their second biggest cost was energy, they suddenly went on a massive thing. They changed their fluorescent lights. They cut their electrical use in half. Wow. Not for the sake of peace and love and harmony, bottom line. Yeah. And when they do it, what does their competition now have to do? Target now responds is the largest installation of solar panels of any company. Mm -hmm. So as you do this, what you're going to see is companies have to embrace these values. Today's consumer cares about their world and wants to deal with, wants to be employed by and work with and buy from companies of shared values. And so if you can put that passion into your product, anybody can make a pair of shoes. But when you buy from Tom's and they give somebody that's never had shoes a pair because you bought a pair, that's a new connection with the customer. That's not half off today's President's Day sale. Right. So the more companies do this, and I give tons of examples of the biggest companies in the world are doing this. Why not start off your company or your new project on that path? Can small business people do this as well. I mean, we talked about the, you know, the visual world where you'll be wearing glasses and I know contacts will also be using that technology um, where, where you really won't be taking your phone out of your pocket. And, and you say yeah. that's, that's within a, just a couple of years, but can, can the people who run small businesses a absolutely also so remember, figure out a way to be a part of that? How do they do that? So remember in the beginning, in the year 2000, I'm old, I can think back that far. Oh, the web, I'm not, I don't get that. I don't, how many small businesses didn't create a website? Correct. And what happened to them all? Gone. And then, oh, these apps, that seems complicated. I don't need an app. And what happened to the businesses that didn't have apps? If we're living most of our life in a digital world and your business isn't there, how are you going to survive? And let me tell you this, in the 21st century, there's only one competitive advantage you can have, and that's getting insights from your data faster than the competition gets from theirs. So I'll give you a, a, a fun game to play with me. You'll get the answer wrong, so don't be embarrassed. <laughs> I'm gonna give you a million dollars if you go back 10 years and pick the number one tech stock that would have made the most money in the past decade. I would say Amazon. Nope. Facebook, no. Twitter, no. Google, no. Apple, no. 
I told you you'd get it wrong. Yeah. Domino's Pizza. Now you say, wait a second, you said a tech stock. The majority of Domino's employees work on IT. Mm. The second they became app centric, they had a direct relationship with their customer, saves you on advertising. You could instantly see trends. Mm. You could test market new things. You could regionalize. You could get insights from your market and they exploded. Wow. That's the world every mom and pop could do. And you say, well, I'm not an engineer. Either was Steve Jobs and he created the first trillion dollar company. Yeah. Back to the first thing I said, you only need two things, insight and perseverance. Everything else can be hired. I have been in tech my entire career. I've been put the first video on a computer. I started on the net in 78. I mean, I could do the first all through it. I'm not an engineer. I've hired engineers. I've always hired people much brighter than me. But I had the insight and the perseverance. Yeah. And those things can be taught. And you're also incredibly creative and you like to think about things. And I know you're creative beyond this stuff because I know you're also an incredible painter. So you, you have a very incredible mind when it comes to thinking of new things and ideas and problem solving. I'm also interested. But, but let me tie the painting back to okay. future proofing you. So when the pandemic started, I didn't think we'd be as incompetent as we turned out to be as a society. I thought we'd be locked up for 30 days, 60 days, maybe 100 days. So having a growth mindset, I wanted to show to the hundreds of thousands of people to follow me on social media. If you don't get the disease, that's horrible. It's deadly. I'm not making light of that. But if you don't actually get the disease, where's the silver lining? How can this be an opportunity? Right. right. And for me, because I speak all over the world, in January of uh, 2020, I was in 12 countries and four continents in one month. Um, so suddenly, I was getting the gift of time. I would not be on an airplane every other day for the first time in decades. What could I do with that time that I always wished I had more time for? So for me, I always paint it. I never shared it professionally. It's my version of meditation and Zen. But I was willing to put myself out there to show people the gift of time. So I committed for the first 100 days to put up a painting and paint every day. And here's what happens with a growth mindset. I wasn't looking for opportunity. Right. I was just trying to share. Galleries saw it. Art agents saw it. Well, it's good, Fast Jay. Forward, you're very kind. <laughs> Fast forward, very in good. September, I had a solo show in New York at a very prestigious Richard Tattinger Gallery. I'm now a professional artist, get commissioned to do works, all because I started and took an, an, an obstacle and it turned into an opportunity. When are you gonna do your first NFT? <laughs> um, I'm going to be doing that tied into the glasses that we're talking about. Ah. And uh, don't want anybody beating me to the punch, but it will be an art installation tied to the NFT. So the Much NFTs are here to stay. If Jay, if Jay Sammet says so, we can all believe that. Yeah, there's always silly hype at the beginning announcing anything. Right. Because unfortunately, there are always people that have no regard for money that can spend money on anything. I mean, yeah. I just, you know, you know, I, I just, you know, shame on them. But that's a topic <laughs> for another day. You know, there's more important things that you could spend that money on to help people that really need the help. But um, I'm really excited about what I what I've mapped out to do in the space. I'm waiting for a specific hardware product to do. And I'm taking the very advice I just gave, right. which is one of the majors will be spending a fortune making sure everybody on the planet knows about my art installation. And wow. I, 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 in my heart of hearts, I know I may have gotten older and gray hair, but I never grew up. So the little boy in me would love to do this. And I think I'm hoping that's inside millions of others to really enjoy what I'm going to create. Yeah. And, you know, just to get back to the technology thing one more time, because there's so much knowledge that you have about the space and about the future of technology. 
you talked about the what, what do we call those glasses what's the actual terminology for that so augmented reality or spatial reality seems to be the the term that we're now is it also to. is also a voice assistant that's part of so that? yeah so augmented doesn't just mean with graphics right so uh if these are pressed against your temples the vibrations can give sound to your inner ear so it can talk to you but nobody else hears it right amazing so, okay jawbone was the first to do that so so wow yeah yeah and so lots of ways to use sound lots of use to use overlays almost limitless in the possibilities so what what is and then let me course, tell you one other place that's going to change in technology okay um we know that the baby boomers are retiring yeah because of this we're going to have a shortage of 110,000 doctors how do we know this we know how long it takes to make a new one you don't <laughs> go okay we need new doctors by tuesday it doesn't work that way right <laughs> so what's going to happen is we're as individuals going to be more responsible for our health in a way that's aided by technology right. wearables so your fitbit that kept track of stat steps also kept track of how much you sleep also keeps track of heart rate you're going to have more wearables with more stuff and it's a lot different when your doctor says, watch what you eat, you know, you might have a heart attack when suddenly your glasses tell you in the next 45 minutes, you will be having a heart attack. <laughs> I suggest you go to the hospital now or die. Um, so there's a lot happening in that space. And when you realize that four of the five leading causes of death, 80% of why we die is self-inflicted. I don't mean by suicide, I mean, obesity and diabetes and right. hypertension, all those things that if we have, you know, a digital nag to help yes. us keep monitor. what we want to do, uh, we'll have more success. Yeah. And so the first people to gamify that, the first people to really tie that into the whole environment, will have tremendous success. Yeah. So um, as we come towards the end of our conversation, um, you know, you're, you're, you're such a positive guy. You're such, such an optimistic guy. You know so much about what people are doing to create our future and you yourself are creating it. So I, I know already that you're a very optimistic person. Um, what do you see for, do you see the roaring twenties again? And, and what do you, what are you most excited about as far as you said, our society was kind of slow to react and solve these problems that we just went through with the pandemic, but um, you must have definitely some ideas about what's exciting to you and, and what, what you know is uh, good news coming down the pike. So tell us a little bit about kind of your mindset when it comes to that. When Mark Andreessen put the interface on the internet, the web, I suddenly got super excited because it meant that anyone, anywhere suddenly would have access to all man's inf information. Millennia is worth of knowledge. Now you could watch cats playing on the piano or you could learn a skill. The choice is yours, but there wasn't a barrier. Right. What's exciting me right now that's been proven and is the 12th truth in future proofing you is the remote workers are our new strategic advantage. And let, me, let me explain what that means. We all realize that companies flipped where people could work from home. But what did that change systemically about society? It means I'm no longer limited to hiring the best people within 10 miles. I can hire the best people on the planet and they may work for less. It also means I don't have to live in a teeny little apartment in some really expensive major city. I could live where the sky is blue and the field is green, or as many millennials are doing, I could be a digital nomad. I could run with the bulls in Spain this month and do my job. And then I could go surf in Thailand and do my job. And I could go down to Mardi Gras. I mean, whatever it is that, that, that you want to do with your life. So what excites me is now that we have decoupled where we are, both in who our customers are, who our coworkers are, it removes the differences between us all. It connects us all, not just digitally, but as people. You know, birds fly around the world, they don't see any borders. So you're going to have to learn to function and compete in the borderless world, but that's also a huge opportunity. 
At the same time, energy, which was a big source of holding back different things, yeah. energy's moving to abundance and near freedom. You know, the Stone Age didn't end because they ran out of stones. The oil age isn't ending because we ran out of oil. Renewables are now actually cheaper. And as you now use solar glass to replace all the windows and buildings, buildings make up 40% of all energy use. Now you're going to have buildings having excess energy. Yeah. Um, robotics are getting more and more useful. I'm the chairman, as you know, of Greenfield Robotics, where we're replacing pesticides and herbicides instead of whoever thought it was a good idea. The best way to grow food is put poison on it that kills everything, but hopefully not us. <laughs> Turned out it does. <laughs> um, Roundup causes cancer. Yeah. So we just made little robots the size of an ice chest that go up and down the rows of, of corn and milo and stuff and just cut off the weeds. Now, let me translate what that one piece of technology does, what gets me so excited. I mean, did I want to be chairman of another company? No. But when somebody came to me with this, I felt morally obligated for mankind to, to, to jump forward. Farmers don't have to buy poisons. They don't have to handle poisons. They make 40% more on their farm. In 2020, no farm in the US made a profit. So now farmers are doing healthier. Number two, what we put in our bodies is healthier. So we don't have you know, cancer and all these other problems that come from. It. Number three, the excess of, fertile, of all these poisons goes down the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico and has killed every fish. So now we stop polluting, but the real benefit Everybody makes money, the company makes money, farmers make money, people get better food. The real benefit is 25% of greenhouse gases come from farming. When you till the soil to get rid of weeds, you're releasing stored carbon. So these little robots will sequester more carbon than anything known to man. So every obstacle, every problem in our lives yeah. is an opportunity. And I'm so excited because this also means that countries that have a shortage of labor now can automate farms the way that everything else has been automated. Right. People that are food insecure will have a greater success at, at being able to have food. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I mean, there's so much great stuff coming out. And as you know, and you've heard me say it in my talks, the best way to predict the future is by hanging out with the people that are creating it. Absolutely. And that's what we were able to just do ourselves here with you. And I, I just, I've been looking forward to this. We've had this on the, the books for a long time because of the book coming out. And I'm so glad we finally got to do it. And it feels like we're kind of hopefully here at the end of, yep. of, a, of a year. Um, of, and I can't uh, wait to get in front of live audiences yeah. and the feedback. It's funny. I've done a lot of Zoom speeches and, and yeah. they're enjoyable, but you can't read the room. All right. You know, yeah. I try to get my stories and information across with humor. It'll be fun to go back and, and, and really be with people. And with the brand new book, I'll just do one pitch at the end of this. Instead of giving a t-shirt to somebody at your conference or something that they're just going to throw away, I let you print your own version of the book jacket where I'll change the back to talk about why your organization is so disruptive, so innovative, so future-proof. And then... I'll sign all those books and give them to people. I'm here just to help as many people I can with the time I have left. And Chris, I thank you for all that you've done to help uh, my speaking. Absolutely. And, and you know, you, you have been so creative with the way you collaborate with your clients, with the books and the, the, the branding that you're able to do, the co-branding and the collaborative branding. It's, it's really amazing. You really do have a lot of creativity within you and these two books and these speeches that you give really influence a lot of people and change people's lives. So thank you, my friend, so much for being on virtually speaking with me and for being such a guy who cares about others, because that's really when it comes down to it, who you really are. So I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Take care. You too. Bye bye.